What is going on, OTB Nation? Welcome into episode number 228 of the allegedly award nominated and honorably mentioned, and of course, viewable on YouTube outside the box podcast, part of the Underground Sports Philadelphia Podcast Network. It's KB, it's DJ coming at you from Underground Studios. We got a nice little show cooked up for you for your your heading into July. It's 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 already July by the time you guys are listening to this, which is crazy. Uh, but we got some good stuff to talk about. But before we get started, make sure you're following us on the socials at OTB Laxpod. Got a few few more players jumping on board, following the brand this weekend. Deej, old Ryland Reese, ever heard of him? Jeff Trainer, ever heard of him? New followers of the show, so they might get some podcast science this week. Now that they uh, are f- following the show, at the very least. Uh, follow us at OTB Lax Pod on Twitter and on Instagram. Follow DJ on Twitter at SCS underscore next great. Follow me at KBIZZL311. Check out the website, undergroundsportsphiladelphia.com, for all of our written content. Subscribe, subscribe, subscribe to the podcast feed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Uh, leave those five star ratings and reviews, of course. And subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. It's the best way to check out all the OTB content. Subscribe. Just search Underground Sports Philadelphia on YouTube. You'll find it. That's where you get OTB in full video form every single Friday, unless specified otherwise. And we let you guys know that if you follow us on the socials. Uh, Big thank you to our sponsors who make this show happen. Tomahawk Shades. Best small batch eyewear in the game. The Tomahawk Prescription Lenses are now in stock. Go to TomahawkShades.com. Use promo code USP for 25% off your order at TomahawkShades.com. Kenwood Beer. Go to KenwoodBeer.com and use the Kenny Tracker to see who's got Kenwood Beer on tap in the Philadelphia area. you got to be 21 or older to do so. And, of course, please drink responsibly. And Bino Board. Go to BinoBoard.com and use our code BinoUSP for 10% off your order. That's boards. That's apparel. That's accessories for your board. And everything in between, Bino USP for 10% off at BinoBoard.com. What's popping, Coach Deej? How how we doing this on this fine final day of June as we record this and first day of July as everybody's watching and listening? June was good to me. June was awesome. Uh, summer ball has been great. Uh, meeting a new bunch of kids is, is different, you know, and, and learning how they play. But uh, it's been awesome. Can't Haven't quite won a championship yet. Uh, uh, we're getting closer and closer. Um, not a big fan of saying I've been cheated, but I've been cheated. <laughs> um, He's been but, bamboozled and flat out deceived. Absolutely. But on a nice little break right now, um, don't have practice again until the fifth. And then uh, we're back on the road that, that next weekend. So be able to actually sit down and watch the games this weekend and really be able to be in the discord and, on Twitter and all that good jazz with the people. Ask some good press conference questions because we were talking before we started recording. You might have saved Rob Pinnell's season. Uh, we'll talk about that, you know, maybe during the bye week uh, after this weekend to see how all, everything all shakes out. But let's recap uh, the weekend we had in Baltimore. I was on site uh, enjoying my time down there in Maryland, and the games were electric, all one-goal games except for one. Um, we had some, you know, guys moving into top tens all time, uh, in some very special places for one of them. And, you know, the standings are wild and nowhere near what anybody probably predicted going into the year. And we might've had one of the best PLL games of all time this past weekend in Baltimore. So to recap, uh, we had those four games go down. This past weekend, it all kicked off on ESPN2, Whips Woods, another installment in the rivalry, uh, and another one-goal game. Whips win 12-11. Then we had the return of the Chaotic Bandits, Sands two of them, and one of them who still hasn't made their PLL debut. Uh, But the Water Dogs said, hey, boys, welcome back. And they win 18-9 over Chaos. And we had the best game, in my opinion, of the weekend. Chrome Cannons 
goes to overtime. Chrome continued their undefeated season, are now 4-0. They win 12-11. And then Atlas and Archers down to the wire. 10-9. Atlas get the dub. Electric weekend in Baltimore. Baltimore never disappoints. Uh, where do we want to start with this with this recap, Deej? Uh, we want to start with the easiest game to talk about. Um, the game that didn't have a lot going on, I should say, in, in terms of uh, Water Dogs chaos. Like, they had a lot going on if you were wearing purple. <laughs> I say, yeah. I mean, they, they had a really good game. Water Dogs had a great game. But like, I guess the biggest storyline is like how flat the chaos guys came out. You know, like, yeah, they – I mean, we were talking about it a little bit off pod. Like, they were just – slow tired. and beat up tired like you could see like the nll season had a wear on them like a lot of people were and us included were like expecting them to come out you know guns blazing ready to go after a tough loss and that was just not the case um i will say part of this win for water dogs hats off and kudos to zach tucci he's been fantastic you know with jake withers being out and officially placed on the injured list retroactive to, I believe, June 14th. Uh, Tushi won 54% of his face-offs against Tommy Kelly. And, you know, Greg Beast, friend of the program, always tweets, it's tough for these first-time PLL guys or rookies to come in and learn the PLL cadence. And Tommy Kelly, obviously not really playing last year, but he knows the cadence for the most part from the bubble and everything. For Tucci to come in and win 54% of his face-offs, get eight ground balls for this team, um... I think this game for the Water Dogs started and finished where the game starts and finishes. The faceoff stripe and with Matt DeLuca stepping in for Dylan Ward, who in the press conference afterwards, Andy Copeland said uh, he Dylan Ward wasn't completely ready to you know face the different angles and shots that you do in a field game as opposed to a box game. And Dylan's sole focus for the last nine months has been winning a championship with the Colorado Mammoth. They just accomplished that. So they gave Matt DeLuca the nod the night before, and he had 55% uh, save percentage, 11 saves in this game. And then, obviously, the offense for the Water Dogs popped off. Connor Kelly, back-to-back incredible games for him, six points in this game. He had two two bombs, shot 50%. Ryan Brown, like you always say, it's one or it's more than one. Uh, he had four single shots in the, it's four solo goals, ten shots in this game. Uh, and Andy Copeland also said that like the more they get Ryan Brown opportunities to shoot, that's where their offense goes, and that's obvious. Michael Sowers played fantastic in this game. Kira McCardle played fantastic in this game. Uh, Ryland Reese had a two bomb and a solo goal. Zach Courier was back to being Zach Courier. I mean, everybody got involved. I th- there were only two guys here on the stat sheet offensively who didn't have a point, and that was Zach Tucci and Jack Hanna, surprisingly. But Ethan Walker, Jake Higgins, Ben Randall, Ryan Conrad, Courier, Ryland Reese, Kieran McCardle, Michael Sowers, Ryan Brown, Connor Kelly all had at least one point. Yeah, like looking at the Water Dogs team, it's weird to say that they're the only team in the league that's it's w- <laughs> this way, but they're – like Ryan Brown has to be going, like – their team plays so much better when he's going. Like they get him going early, defenses overcompensate for it and opens up for so many other guys. Like there's no other team except maybe Chaos that like I would say maybe like Dane Smith like has to be going for them where things don't look as well. Maybe Josh Byrne is that guy, but like other than that, there aren't other teams. Like the Redwoods, like it's just an entire offensive thing with them. It's mm-hmm. not even one guy. Like Either the entire offense has it or nobody has it. But like, Is it fair to say, because we kind of saw the effects of when he wasn't going, if Jeff Teat's not going? I was I was thinking about that, but like also, like I don't know because we haven't we seen that. We really only got like the one. This is the first time we've seen that. Like We've seen this multiple times with the Water Dogs. We've seen it multiple times with Chaos. Like When those guys aren't going, their offenses very much suffer but other guys can still do a little something. What about whips? I think whips are very much in a Redwood scenario. Either their offense has it or they don't. You know, and they get a couple. I was going to say, when Rambo's not going, it feels like their offense kind of like really takes a dip because of 
the matchup that he draws, and then just his pure ability to score, obviously. But I feel like it's weird, but I feel like Zed like completely negates that. Like we are seeing that earlier in the year because Zed was not there, but like with Zed there, he still creates enough offense where it doesn't seem like they really it seems like Rambo just has a quiet game. I was like, just oh. thinking last year too when he was just completely out. Well, yeah, he was hurt. But then it was just like, you know, they weren't even thinking about it because Rambo's hurt. And I mean they weren't even playing bad. They really were losing games by Their a goal or two. Worse. Their defense was the real problem. Their offense was doing fine. It's like, you know, when he plays like that, it's just like, oh, Rambo had a bad game, only had one goal, one assist, or you only had an assist, no goals. But like, It's weird to say. I feel like you would say with Cannons, if their two-man game with whoever is paired with Lyle isn't going, their offense kind of falls flat. And we've seen that, obviously, like last year with Paul and now with Asher. Like, Asher has been fantastic this year. Yeah, I mean, I think that was, like I said, that was somebody they needed to pick up during when we were doing draft preview and stuff. This was like, Ken is the perfect fit for him, and we're seeing that now, especially in moving down to attack. I think that was an awesome move. But, yeah, that's a, pretty much along the same lines. But I think that's only a when Lyle Thompson's in the game. Because when he was hurt, I mean, the offense didn't look bad, and they didn't really do the whole two-man thing. They kind of went with a completely different set, and it worked. So yeah. maybe maybe cannons do fall in that, and it's no Lyle Thompson. It's completely different. Yeah, I mean, and I asked Michael Sowers in the press conference after because he has been notorious this year when he's at the podium talking about how this Water Dogs team has layers. And I said, is this what it's like, you know, when the layers get going? And he said, yeah, that's when it's most fun is when we have all these guys contributing. It's not just one guy who we need to rely on to score. That's the layers of this team, and that's what makes it so fun. And I think from a chaos standpoint, Andy Towers said it best. Like he'd rather start zero and four with this squad in the locker room than be you know six and zero and going into the first round of the playoffs and getting dominated. He was like he he basically broke it down. They need to win four out of the next six to make the playoffs. And he said even worst case scenario, we might only need to win three and we'll get in. Um, I had never seen a coach coming off such a bad loss in such a fired up, like ready to go, like could have gone back out there in 40 minutes and played another game. And that's just AT. Um, well, you do. It's me, but <laughs> you know, other than me, yeah, it's just AT, you know, it's, but it's something about it. That's not even just AT as a guy because the loss is way heavier on coaches than they do on players. That's him getting energy from his team after. He mm -hmm. went and talked to him in the locker room and stuff, and guys were like, it's fine. We're good. We've been here before. We know what we have to do. We just have to get back to work, go to practice, work on this, this, and this, and then come out and win the next game. Like, when your team talks that way to you after a loss as a coach, you forget anything negative you have to say. And then you're totally just making practice plans and coming up with stuff to make your team better because you're like, you're right. We do have this. We can go ahead and win four of the next six and be in the back in the playoffs. We've done this before. We can do it again. There's a certain level of confidence and relaxation that comes when your team is ready to handle and get back to it after a loss versus you. Yeah. Big Even because like during this season, like I, I used to come and talk to you, like losses were so heavy on me. Like I hated losing, especially because I just felt so hopeless and like not helpful and so helpless, like not giving them the tools they needed. Mm -hmm. But they talked to me after games, like would text me after games or would show up the next day at practice, biggest smiles on their faces already running around. I'm like, how are you guys so happy and so ready to work after getting blown out by 20? But, like, it just made me want to continue to put in that work as a coach because if they're going to do it, I have to do it too. So, like, I think a little bit of that helps out chaos too. Like, he doesn't have to stress so much as, about a loss. He can just let it go because he's like, yeah. if they're not worrying about it, why should I? And also big shout-out to the big homie Jared Newman with the – incredible lack strap uh and lack straps homies shout out to them are now making them you can buy them this is not an ad but you can buy them uh the two packs of you know her body her choice lack straps i believe they're eight dollars and all the the money is going directly to planned parenthood and abortion uh funds um jared's a fucking man like plain and Absolutely. simple that's the homie 
And for him to go out there and do that, you know, it's just awesome. Just shows you how on the field, like Jared's the best and how off the field, he's even better than the best. Um, so that was awesome to see, uh, from Jared. Um, should we talk about the rivalry? Cause there's some juicy stuff after the game. We can definitely talk about the rivalry. Whips Woods, 12, 11 whips win. Um, another, it was a great game. Like even though the Redwoods lost and you know, DJ and I are, are woods guys. It's a great game. This is one of the best games I think in this rivalry, like ever. Um, cause there've been other one goal games, but like they've been sloppy or like it, it felt like it should have been worse than a one goal game. This one was very competitive, very back and forth. Um, and whip snakes just went on that run in the third quarter. And that's really what, you know, decided everything pretty much. Um, I just need, I just, I just need consistency at our, for lack of a better term for everybody, all the casuals, the special teams positions. I don't know what's wrong with TD right now. Um, granted, I know Joe Nordella knows him like the back of his hand, but I think John Sexton getting back into the mix is helping for sure. I just need TD to go out there and be TD again. And I know he's coming off his first full NLL season. I know he didn't have Sexton for the first three weeks of the season. But something just feels weird when, like, he's out there losing. Like, it just doesn't feel right. feels like we're in a what-if from Marvel situation. Um, And I told you before we started recording, this was Tim Troutner's worst game of the season. Hands down. Yeah, I think you're tripping on TD a little bit, I think. I know he's tired. I just – I I don't even think it's a tired thing, like – a lot of people don't realize, like, like you brought up John Sexton, like that's a huge part of it. Like, totally, face off is not just one guy; like it's a unit. And 100%. if your unit isn't playing at its top tier, you're gonna struggle as a face off guy. Because TD was in a scenario where he felt like he had to win everything to himself, whether it was back or it was forward. Like he felt like. If we're going to win a face-off, I'm the one that has to pick up the ground ball. So I need to win the clamp. I need to play it to myself. Like, that's a lot of stress to put on yourself as a face-off guy, a lot to think about. So it's messing with his rhythm. Now, as we we could see it in that game, it was tough to go against Joe Nardella to, you know, have John Sexton back as a second game and for him to actually catch his rhythm. But we could see TD getting more comfortable at the stripe Mm -hmm. throughout that game because he's like, okay, my unit is here. I know these guys will pick up ground balls. I know Sexton will come in and help out. Like now I can just focus on playing my position. I can just take face offs. Win the clamp, lose the clamp. I, it just has to be a ground ball. We have to win it versus I need to do it myself. I think that was the whole thing with TD. Tim. Real quick he, on TD, just from me, I don't, I'm not even like trying to like bash him. I think it's more just I have such high expectations for him as a player in general that like, I just want to see him succeed because I know what he's capable of. I guess I just know after having such a good faceoff guy in college, like the emphasis of wing play was so important to us. And like, we talked about it so much that I know like how, how important it is for a faceoff guy and how much it can mess with their rhythm. And no offense to Kyle Hartzell. He's just old. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, in no offense to Ryan Kennedy or Arden Cohen, but those guys are close guys. Playing LSM as a close guy is very different. It's it's not the same. You know what you're doing, but you don't at the same time. Um, but yeah, I, I know you weren't coming at TD in any yeah, kind of way. But just for the kinda, people listening. And- yeah, throwing out kind of a idea on why it would seem he took a step back. In reality, I don't think he has at all. Yeah. It's just, he was just in a very weird scenario. And then there's good old Timmy T. I'll let you have the floor. Triple T. I don't even need the floor. Triple like, T in the morning. <laughs> triple T in the morning. If y'all know that reference, comment down below on YouTube. It's just ridiculous, man. Like he's had a tough year to start. And I like I don't know what it is. I mean, I've well, do you want thousand. do you want good news that I don't believe I told you? I don't This was addressed in the me. press conference afterwards. Uh, I forget who asked the question, so I apologize. It might have been Kevin Brown. Um, Nat said the goalie battles reopened. 
Oh, I figured it would be. Nat's not the kind of guy to just. Ride He's just with typically it. not the one to drop that in a yeah. press conference per se. So that kind of was like, oh, okay, like that, they're that's reevaluating the, some yeah. things. That's the surprising part of this is that he said it in a press He dropped conference. a couple things in this press conference. Which I'm excited to hear the rest. <laughs> I'm I'm mad I was coaching and out in the sun while you were talking to people in press conferences. But no, coaching's coaching so much fun. But yeah, like the thing with Timmy T is he struggled to open up the year. I said we should go get Matt DeLuca a long time ago. Other than that, um I, I don't know what it is like he's having trouble seeing the ball and like as a goalie you cannot have trouble seeing which oddly the ball. enough his best game was in poor weather awful weather awful like weather. it wasn't even like that it was raining but long island like it was that weird like clouds were in the sky as it was turning to night and he had his best game of the year <laughs> yeah i just don't think he feels any real pressure I think see, like I, I almost feel like this is going to be wild to say, but it almost feels like he feels like his job is secure. Like I feel the complete opposite. I feel like he's over like overthinking is not the right word. So but I, I feel like he's like playing so tight and so doing, tense that that's what all these mistakes are. Like, I feel like he feels like his job is on the line. So basically, you think he's doing what TD is doing and putting a lot of pressure on himself to play better, even more than TD, honestly. Yeah, because at least TD is like, there's other like circumstances for him. Right. Tim, I feel like it's one of those things where like he's been under a microscope since the bubble, and like the pressure's like it's like a pressure cooker and it's ready to burst, and like you can tell like he's playing tight, he's not loose at all. Like, there were moments last year where you could see, like, oh, wow, like, he's feeling it. He he looks good. And then there were moments where it was like, damn, like, what the hell's going on? Like, just getting beat in the five hole. And then this year, it's everywhere. It's not just the five hole that's beating him. He just looks, like, so tense. Like, that's the only word that I can think of. Like, he looks like he's just a brick wall out there in the worst way possible where, like, he just can't move. Yeah, I don't know if it's – but, I, like, when I think of stuff like that, like, always think, like, guys play relaxed and, like, kind of just, like, lose it because they don't feel any pressure from anyone taking their spot. Like, let's look back at Jack Kelly last year. Like, even when he stepped in, he played phenomenal, but he never got the start. He got one start. You know what I'm saying? Like, there's no real pressure there on Timmy – to play better like Kyle Burnlord, perfect example he played bad last year he got the real boot and sat the pine for the rest of the year and now look at him he's arguably best goalie in the cop or best goalie in the league right now he's got top two save percentage and he's up there in saves as well so it's like you have to put pressure on special teams you know positions to force them to play to their potential or you run into situations like this that was the main reason I said go get Matt DeLuca. Do I have anything against Jack Kelly? No. I think Jack Kelly's phenomenal. But if we're not going to play him and, like, force Timmy to play better, then go get someone you will play who will force him to play better. Like, and I think not... the, like, the annoying part about this game, too, was so winnable. Even with Tim playing terribly and even with TD kind of getting a little outworked by Joe, I'll tell you where they lost it watching it in person and you can look at it at the box score too it tells the, the story here whip snakes went three for three on the power play whip snakes went three for three on the power play you couldn't kill one penalty what did the woods go on the power play oh for one that's the my power play is the power play as a whole was bad both ends that might be my biggest thing this year with the woods i can i can deal with penalty kill being somewhat bad because i get it one playing defense and two you're down a man if the ball moves quicker than feet if they're moving the ball fast enough they're gonna get a good shot off and if your goalie doesn't make a spectacular save they're gonna score versus and we also left mike Earhart open wide enough for him to get a ridiculous two bomb rip off that 
Yeah. There's the game right there. Yeah. And so it's like, I understand, you know, man down being a, a little iffy, but your man up has to be spot on. You should be over 70% on the man up. Like, all you have to do is move the ball, get a carry, pull a guy out, and there's, there's your two on one. You either the guy in the middle is going to follow the guy out or the guy, or they won't, you, you know? And if they follow him out, you got the fill in guy right on crease. And if they don't follow him out, you got the pop out shot for time and room. That is 100% foolproof. The only reason it's 70% is because, you know, there's a picked off pass or a save somewhere, a drop pass and a ground ball, that kind of stuff. But you should easily be over 70% as a man up. And the woods are nowhere near that. And I'll tell you this too Redwoods won the shots on goal battle, did 23 shots on goal. Grant Kyle Burnlore played out of his mind. Redwoods dominated the turnover game. They had 15 caused turnovers to Whip Snakes, six. And you kept it relatively close in the ground ball game, even with TD going 40%. It was 33 to 25. You had 36 shots to Whip Snakes, 29. And they won, and Redwoods won the turnover game. They only turned it over sixteen times. Whip Snakes turned it over twenty four times in this game. Timmy's got to play better, or just not play at all. Like I'm being a little harsh, maybe, but like at this point, like no, I agree. I, like I said, this was his worst game of the season and one of the worst games of his career. Yeah, yeah, and it's at that point where like you don't want to say like. He's the reason why they haven't won a championship. But, like, I mean, what else are we supposed to say? Like, they literally have everything else they need. But then your goalie's having four saves in a game. Doesn't sound like a championship goalie to me. And this isn't the first time he's done that. Before he got pulled in that game, he had no saves at halftime. How many shots did he see that have no saves at halftime? That's not okay. Hey, I do got to say on a positive note, you gonna give you gonna give a tip of the cap to number fifty two again? I will. Another great will. game. He's been playing well. I I will not. I won't say anything bad about him until he I looks like twenty nineteen Garrett Apple again. He looks good. He's like, rocking. He looks. Me. He looks very comfortable. I'll say. He, he's rocking those stupid sticks back then. Or no. No, that was no. the bubble. That was, yeah, that was the bubble. But yeah, he no, looks, he's he looks he, fantastic right now. He looks good. And I can't I can't complain about it. Um obviously he doesn't look better than Eddie, but Eddie looks so good we don't talk about him. Like you know, yeah, I think both of them, those guys. Both of them are kinda like they're playing so well that you don't have to even like mention them. Like the Arden, only reason you're mentioning them is because they're bullying people. Arden Arden is settling in. It's, it, I do want to see more from him, though. It takes a little bit of time to get into the league and like really figure it out. Well, yeah, he was carrying twenty um, extra numbers on his jersey for a little bit, so probably twenty extra pounds with it too. But yeah, He's still carrying twenty extra numbers. <laughs> <laughs> Leave him alone. Forty-one is all right. Forty. It's forty. Or, it's it around 40. forty. I mean, forty is cool. Forty is cool. And just because of well! <laughs> just because of where he came from. Yeah. Sure, I'll give him that. It's still bad, um, but that's the thing. This game was winnable. But Kevin Brown did ask in the press conference, and I felt like this came from the clouds. If they're like uh, questioning the timetable of Matt Landis, <laughs> and Nat basically said he's aware there's a timeline, but there's no time frame on the timeline. That's the first time we've truly heard. Number 43's name from the leader himself mm -hmm. since mm -hmm. 2019. And what that tells me... West Coast Woods fans, <laughs> buckle up. <laughs> that and... Get your tickies. Because it's it's this year. We just don't know when. Right. That, that is what I gathered from that. Is Matt Landis will play this season. We just don't know when exactly this season he will play. Do we want to make a friendly, just like guesstimation? Absolutely. Of what weekend? Absolutely. 
Because I assume it's going to be West Coast, obviously. You think so? Uh, being that from an Instagram story last year, he was based in San Diego because he was at a Padres game as well. Um, mm -hmm. shout mm -hmm. out Matt Landis. Uh, so West Coast wise, do we want to include Dallas in the West Coast? Or is that Central? Midwest? Like, to where is Dallas? <laughs> <laughs> right. Because it's kind of like in the middle of the country in all reality. So everything past the Eastern time zone, I should say, post All-Star break, is Dallas, Denver, Salt Lake City, Seattle. If and when Matt Landis does play, which DJ talked about preseason of it happening, so please credit Outside the Box podcast when Matt Landis gets activated. Um, oh, oh, they won't hear the end of that. <laughs> Whether it's from me or it's on the pod page, someone, someone's going to be tweeting about that. Because, yeah, I, I said that first. Because he's an island boy. <laughs> um, which one do you think is the most likely of Dallas, Denver, Salt Lake, Seattle? I think Denver. That's where I was leaning to. I think Denver. Um, I was either thinking Denver or Salt Lake. I think Salt Lake. I was thinking Salt Lake. I just think it's a little too late. I think that if they're going to go with it, they're going to give him a full month or so to get Well, into. I should preface this. I think he'll get activated Denver. He'll play Salt Lake for the first oh, time. Oh, I think once he's activated, he plays. It's, it's a term of getting him back into PLL action and, and movement. Like, it's going to be rocky for him when he gets back, but he's going to play right away. I wouldn't expect him to come back and for them to have him on the roster for him not to play. I also think it depends on where they are standings-wise altogether if he gets activated and if he does when he plays. Well, that's why I say he's going to play right away because they'll be in a position where they're going to go into playoffs, and if he's going to play, he's going to play in the playoffs. You're going to want him to be in motion in the playoffs. So give him at least a full month to get back into PLL motion. So then when you hit the first week, my birthday weekend in uh, in Boston, he's good to go and you have no worries. Technically, he would have a month if he played Salt Lake because there's the bye week in between. Uh, That's Seattle not a month. And Boston. That's not a month. Well, I'm saying, like, with my saying, like, he gets activated in Denver, like, added to the 25-man roster, but then plays. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, month playing. Like, he's going to play that those three weeks. So that way he gets, like, a full, like, month of PLO play. Well, yeah, he'll get a full month when we were in the first round. <laughs> I mean, full month before first round. Like he's already got three games under the belt before playoffs start. I'll also go hot take too. It wouldn't surprise me if he doesn't get activated. No, not at all. I actually lean more that like he's not gonna get activated. I don't know if I'm biased because of what I said, but I'm definitely thinking he's gonna get. Activated. I feel like him, him coming back this year is more a break glass in case of emergency. To, um, right, as of right now we are in emergency break as glass of right, right now. now break glass right now well break right now right now maybe i'm hitting the panic button too early break it by side right now you're in the playoffs you're in the playoffs barely you're the six seed we're in the playoffs because a bunch of teams suck <laughs> we're not in the playoffs because we're good break the glass you're in the playoffs though you got to remember i'm a pistons packers Red Wings well, fan. Like, we're LeBron breaking fan. We, we do, we're breaking glass right now. <laughs> Things don't look good this early in the regular season. You break Trade glass. the whole team. <laughs> we break glass. <laughs> that is how things get fixed. <laughs> have That's you not, getting clipped. <laughs> have you not seen the GM make moves in the middle of the season? <laughs> yeah, Matt St. Laurent is notorious for making moves in the middle of the season, it's especially true. signing off from being on our podcast and then doing it 30 seconds later. That was awful. <laughs> I tell you about that year one. Yes. Signed up 30 seconds later. Boom. Westburg Redwoods. 
like thanks bro you could have told us insane um yeah this is a must win weekend though for the redwoods imo and i don't know if they're gonna win them archers boys are hot after that game last week i'll tell you that much i'll tell you that much they are hot uh it's also hot in the streets that I'm going to be asking Ben Rubio after every single game this season, f- moving on from here on out, how he felt about Atlas's substitution game. Because he mm. brought that up on Long Island, saying that he felt that the substitution game against the Whips was pretty bad. So I asked him about it this week, and he said he felt like they improved a lot, but it's going to be something they monitor all season. So that's going to be something I take a look at all year long also i was correct according to pll stats justin Anasio was back last week interesting i wasn't sure if he was or not but he was uh but that didn't stop trevor baptiste from just going sicko mode and winning 19 of 22 faceoffs that he took <laughs> yeah yeah which is insane archers were up 5-4 in the first quarter and then it was 6-5 Atlas going into halftime. And then they just went dead step even the rest of the way. Archers getting shut out in the second quarter kind of determined everything. Um, I have to ask you this. Is Matt Moore rookie of the year? He's certainly in the top three conversation as of this oh, moment for a me. Thousand, a thousand percent in the top three, but I don't know if I can say rookie of the year. Because I don't know if you saw this stat tweeted out. Matt Moore now has a hat trick of hat tricks. Three straight games for Matt Moore with a hat trick. But, I mean, it's easy to do that when you're on that offense. But also, we remember week one where he kind of disappeared. And then they fixed what they were doing, and he's running out of the box now. Well, since I, Charlotte, I which told you that has changed everything for their offense. And I'm intrigued once we figure out if Grant Amen's going to play this year, <laughs> um, how that just continues to improve for Matt Moore with Grant in the lineup. And I thought Matt Moore brought up a very interesting point in the press conference too. Afterwards, he said. Basically, playing that midfield position is kind of what he equated to. He's just trying to emulate Ryan Ambler's game. Well, I mean, I mentioned that right away after that first game. I was like, this offense struggled because they put Matt Moore at X. I was like, that took away from the flow of what they were used to running with Grant Amet down there. He's not as similar of a player as Amet is. And I was like, I thought he was much better – playing for Virginia when he was running that hybrid role up top. I don't know if Bates was listening or not, but he threw Connor Simone down low, starts running Matt Moore out of the box, and poof, Archer's offense is back to normal. Like, it was nothing, you know? So, I'm not going to say it was me, but it was probably me. Um, but, yeah, that was that was all it was for me. I can't say he's Rookie of the Year because I just think Brendan Nickturn is. Look Brendan at us Nick- being on the same page. Brennan Nickturn has been absolutely unbelievable. You mean Rocket Raccoon? Rocket, whatever you want to call him. You Rocket lo- Raccoon, Brennan you, you love the gif I tweet out every time he scores? Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's spot on. Like, I mean, he's just been unbelievable. And it's tough to say because, like, their offense is so good, especially that attack line. But he's just stood out so much in terms of all the other rookies. Yeah, Matt Moore is, like, he's on my radar. Like, big, I just, I'm excited to continue watching him, like, progress. And, like, if he continues to score hat tricks, like, pop off, kid. And it's great for my brand because Matt Moore's wearing number 11. Um, Marcus Holman moved into top 10 all time in points in Baltimore, which was awesome to see. Obviously, Baltimore right in his backyard. Uh, I think it was last year. He talked about, you know, when he was a kid, he and his friends used to hop the fence at Hopkins to go shoot late at night, which I think is just an all-time story. Um, So very happy for Marcus. Quietest Will Manny game of the season, only two assists. Um, Atlas defense did a really good job of kind of just keying in on him. Um, Deso scored coming back to Hopkins, which was very cool. 
I think the archers will be fine. Um, am I crazy for saying that I'd much rather see Libetti taking faceoffs for this team? No, no, not at all. Um, obviously, he seems like he like just got a grasp of the cadence and everything so much quicker than Justin. Yeah, I mean, he did a phenomenal job of adjusting to the league and hopping in and like getting with that unit and being like, hey, this is how I'm going to be. So this is how we got to figure it out. Like he gelled with that unit very well and they did a good job. And I just think Anasio's just having trouble, not only just, you know, with visa issues, but also just with getting the cadence and getting uh, adjusted with his unit and all of that. Like, face also off, a like tough welcome back facing off against Trevor Baptiste. But also that. Yeah. So, like, I think they should be one of the few teams that dresses two face off guys and runs a tandem for a while until they can figure out, like, who they really, who really is the best option for their team. But I think change of pace right now might be best for them man they traded bones kelly and i'm starting like week by week and this is no offense to justin week by week i'm like man that was a mistake but like that's just a gamble you take. i think it's a gamble you take for the future like mm-hmm. totally bones is going to be good now and maybe for the next few years but like once a Anas- Anasio gets the cadence and stuff down like he's going to be good if quite a few years longer than Stephen Kelly was. Uh, you know who made his debut this weekend, too? My boy Jake Carraway. <laughs> it was so dope seeing him back out there, man. The I jersey know. was tucked. Oh, it was great. I just, I, he's one of my favorite guys in the league, man. It's just nice seeing the guys out there that, like, you know he's a good player. And, Seeing him back out there was was awesome. I hope he gets more opportunities because he deserves it. Um, Jeff T, fantastic. They're another team like like we were talking about earlier. Like I do think you got to give Jeff T more than and Rubio said this in the press conference too. He said we got to give Jeff T more than two opportunities to shoot the ball because that's all he had against Whip Snakes. Um, Eric Law was fantastic. Had the disgusting. Crease dive. Um, Jeff T had the most absurd one-handed goal ever. That was ridiculous. Did you see his explanation about that? No. I'm going to play this for you. I'm going to play this for you because you are going to die. It's the most Jeff T answer to a question ever. Like, we were in the press conference. Like, I think... uh, I think Keegs asked the question. It was either Keegs or uh, Kevin Brown. And <laughs> when Jeff answered this, Keegs and I were both just cracking up in the Zoom call. It is the most Jeff T response of all time. Yeah, um, I, I guess sometimes I, I put myself in a, a, a crappy spot, and uh, the only way out of it is to kind of do something creative. Um, so that's kind of what happened on that play. But um, other than that, just you know, just kind of playing with the flow, you know, feeding off teammates and, and just having fun out there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kind of just did something I didn't mean to do, so I had no choice but to do that. Kind of got put in a sticky situation, so I uh, just had to get creative. The most That's Jeff hilarious. T answer of all time. Um, that goal was disgusting. Goal of the year nomination from me, at least, oh, to this point. Um, definitely. Doc's Aiken? How, like, he, I feel like he's the forgotten one on this team. Oh, had, a, had a solid game, scored, had an assist. I feel like he always gets forgetting about, forgotten about in this Atlas offense. I'm not letting you forgetting about that forever. Forgetting, <laughs> I, I do. I reckon I do be forgetting. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, like like I said, on on such a cluttered offense, like you run into guys who get push to the side but i think for docs that's good um i think he's kind of always going to get brushed off but that's kind of setting him up to constantly get matched up on short sticks and there aren't too many that can you know defend him considering the best ones on his team so he doesn't have to worry about that on game day um and you know it's really kind of setting him up to continue to have these sneaky good games where he's got two three goals and an assist or you know, a goal and two assists where, you know, he's racking up points, but it's not 
on this big broad spectrum where mm-hmm. everybody's like, whoa, Doc's Aiken. But then, you know, toward the end of the season, people are looking at numbers and it's like, whoa, Doc's Aiken was actually really productive for the Atlas. Like, that's kind of what you want out of a player who like flies under the radar because of, you know, how the team is constructed. Two rookie of the year candidates faced off in the game of the year so far. Asher Knowlton, six points for, for the Cannons. Brendan Nick turned four goal or four assists, one goal, game winning assist. And two of the most shout out Mike Messenger. The I was man. about to say, two of the most bananas goals of the season. Ryan Tarafanko, friend of the program, with the most disgusting, ridiculous fake, and then Barry for the game tying goal. And then Mike Messenger just Message delivered, baby. Absolute weapon. Um, the fact that he's playing short stick D midi, but he's an offensive guy, is hilarious to me. Um, he's just a Swiss Army knife right now. And the fact that he had just the wherewithal to be like, yeah, I'm open on that play. And Nick Turn just, whoop. It's, Disgusting. It's... He had two, both of his goals in this game were gross. I need Jack Near to take notes. Because Jack Neer well, loves to just hang out on offense. Jack Neer's going to have a lot of time to take some notes because he's going to be out for a little bit. I, I saw that. So if he's going to be trying to stay down on offense and he used to be be productive down on offense and have a crease dive or goal or two, like Messenger has like three or four of those already Here's this the thing, year. Jack like, Neer can't shoot. I know. That's why he needs to just get off the field. Like that's really what I was pointing out here is that Ugh. Mike Mess- Jack Neer is not Mike No Messenger. offense to Jack Neer, but <laughs> – Know your role and play it. No offense to Jack Near, because he's a very good player. But when he's running down and he's on the offensive side of the field, it reminds me of the three-headed dragon meme. <laughs> like, that's where my brain goes every time. And it's I'm just silly. like, Jack, what are you doing? Get off the field. <laughs> it's literally just the derp dragon. It's ridiculous. Like, but no, like that. That was a phenomenal. That was, like you said, probably, arguably the best game we've ever seen from the PLL this season, at least. I don't know. There's been some good ones. That was pretty good. This is up there, though. This was like Chrome goes on that six zero run. Until um, I said, until uh, Anderson scored the game tire, I really thought the cross Twitter and Discord were going to blow up with Cannons upsetting Chrome. I see what you did there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. That was actually we were in the press box. <laughs> I was I was in the press box talking to some of the guys up there. I was like, please tie this. Send it to overtime. This game has been too good. Boom. J A scores. I was like, there's one. Chrome cut it down to three. Um, I forget who scored after J.A. But then Connor Farrell at the strike two down the stretch. You want to talk about somebody who's back? You want to talk about a Chrome back? It's Connor Farrell. My God. 16 for 25, 12 ground balls. He's playing even better than he did in 2019. He's playing so confident. He's playing strong. He's playing smart. He looks fantastic out there, and whatever they did in the offseason to get him ready, he looks absolutely amazing. Um, this Chrome team, man, we said it. They could be sneaky good, and we went conservative with our pick of 5-5. Five and five. Well, Deej, they're one win away from 5-0, and oh. <laughs> which I love. Like, I, I'm, a, I'm rooting for this team to play well. Like, we... Chrome does not have fans. Like, to put it plain and simple. They they don't have a fan base like Whips, like Redwoods, um, like Water Dogs, you know, with the, the outside sourced in fan base there from Barstool and everything. Not like Cannons, who had a Boston home base to begin with. Chrome were like the laughing stock of the league. And I'm glad we adopted them into our our cult of OTB as like the pod team. Like, yes, we're Redwoods guys, but like Chrome is like our pod team that we just like adamantly root for to play well and want to see them succeed. 
And it, it's like we have three of those teams. It's Redwoods, Chaos, and Chrome right now. <laughs> it's a perfect and I, amount. And I personally just enjoy watching the Archers play. Um, but I feel like that's anybody. Like, if you tell somebody, go watch the PLL, you typically tell, hey, go watch the Archers play. Because you'll have a lot of fun watching them. Um, but I am just so happy for this Chrome team. Like, yeah, I think, you know, they're in a great spot moving forward. Did you see the year. Jesse Bernhardt halftime speech, by the way? No. <sighs> I'm playing this for you as well. Because I asked I asked Sudo about this in the press conference. He was like, it was nice that I kind of just got to, like, step back and, like, you know, focus on the coaching aspect of things. And Jesse, you know, took it to him a little. <laughs> yeah, that's why it's, like, it's cool watching afterward because I don't watch any of that stuff. I just skip through all the commercials, all the replay. Like, I'm not watching – three replays of the same goal. I'm sorry. They score the goal. I'm skipping that next minute and a half and going on to the rest of the play. Um, I skipped the commercial, skipped in between quarters, halftime, all this. So I didn't see it because I was like. I'm Here's Jesse Bernard at halftime. They tweeted this, by the way. This was <laughs> tweeted from the Chrome's account at halftime. We're playing like a bunch of dumb right now. Dumb lacrosse players. We are not that dumb. Shooting on the same level. Not subbing right. Full start to the f***ing face-off facts. We're not that bad and they're not that f***ing good. You want to play here? This is the same f- last week. He's f- right. They don't f- respect us. We played two f- games in one. We're f- better than that. We're f- smarter lacrosse players. Dumb loses more than smart f- wins. They're not that f- smart. We're not that f- dumb. You fucking got me? If you're not f- ready to go out, we'll play with f- 10. Smart! Smart! Let's go! Let's go, baby. <laughs> I mean, that's just a Electric coach. factory. That, Electric that, factory. That's just a coach. Should, should I They're talk? not that fucking smart. We're not that fucking dumb is an all-time line. Should I talk to my 14 to 17-year-old high school boys that way? No, I'd pay probably. money. I'd pay no. money. Listen, no, probably not. But do I? Absolutely. I, I absolutely. That's exactly how I talk to them. <laughs> That's amazing. Because th- there's no other way to fire up a bunch of dudes. Like I'm sorry, but like that is the best way to fire up a bunch of dudes. Let's make them feel like you don't respect them. Make them feel humiliated and I don't know, like depressed. And then they're just instantly, like, let's, let's go. go! <laughs> Everybody's like through the roof and like can just it's play like they just like off. snorted creatine. And, and can just play their ass off. All of I played sudden. that for Eric Minio in the premiere zone at halftime, and he was, like, ready to run through a brick wall. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That dude's he's great. He, he's, like, and he's a pass. he's a chrome guy. He's an OG chrome guy. Yes, he's a legit chrome guy. And, like, I will say, I don't know if this is, like, a new thing now, like, this year, but chrome is getting some fans. They're in the Discord, and they, they say some stuff. You know I adopted Chrome when when I made that bet with you last year on Long Island, and I bought this hat that I'm wearing on the pod right now. If you go to YouTube, you'll see it. Um, That was the moment that I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy in. And Dom, OG co-host of this show, Chrome guy, right off rip, 2019, pick Chrome. So we we have Chrome ties on this show. Um, Baltimore was great. Jimmy Seafood, fantastic. Shout out to the fam. Um tweeted at me when i tweeted my my food picks and said feast fit for a king shout out to jimmy c they never disappoint like never disappoint and this is not an ad if they want to advertise i'd be more than happy to have them as as a sponsor but my goodness they never disappoint um just fantastic food fantastic service it's just a good vibe there um so shout out to jimmy seafood shout out baltimore Let's get into Minnesota, Deej. We're going to uh, hashtag quote-unquote Midwest. A um, lot of good matchups this week. Looking forward to some of these games in particular. We'll start off. These are the matchups. Archers-Redwoods kick off the weekend at 7 p.m. on Friday. 9.45 p.m. we get Atlas and Chrome. Saturday, 6 p.m. we get Chaos Cannons. And then Saturday at 8.45, we get Whip Snakes Water Dogs, which I said earlier this year, that should be more of a rivalry than it is. So hopefully it uh, turns out that way. Um, I think that's the 
Is that the only repeat matchup we've had so far this year? Yes, I believe so. Because they played week two, obviously, and that went into overtime. Um, Archer's Woods, things I'm looking for. This, If there was ever a get-right game for TD, and I use that lightly, obviously, but if there was ever a moment for him to go out and dominate, it's this week. Um, looking for that. Intrigued to see who's in net for Redwoods. Um, and I just want to continue to see RP3 doing what he's been doing. Um, because ever since you asked him a certain question in the press conference after Charlotte, he's completely changed. He's gone more like alpha and like dominant in terms of attacking. Um, and I just want to continue to see, you know, the two, uh, short Kings cab and rider providing for the offense. Um, that's my my keys for redwoods those three things is what i'm looking for well you know you bring up what i said to rob and for those of you that don't know i pretty much just asked like are they either a gonna add someone to the middle to you know add some flow to the offense that way to have an inside threat or is the you know are they just gonna keep pushing from the mid and hoping something good happens or is the attack gonna step up and start initiating and going for it and Rob's like, he, he was just totally honest. He's like, we haven't been good enough down an attack. We haven't initiated. We kind of just sat back and let the middies do it. And it's not fair to them. It's not how we want to play. So, like, we got to change it. He's completely done that. And all of them have. And I think that's why the Woods have looked really good moving forward. Like, they're working as a six-man unit on offense, a well-oiled machine. They're now all initiating. How do you stop an offense that has six – capable initiators on the field it's almost impossible you can't really slide because everybody can catch and shoot so now you're asking everybody to play island one-on-one -on -one defense and that gets very tough so now i i'm very happy with the question i asked very happy with the response of on field play from the woods um my main thing is going to be defense i think they've slacked a little from what we've seen in the past from the woods i think they got to step it up um Obviously, have to continue to win or keep the ground ball game close. And then, um, obviously, goalie play. I want to see who's going to be in net and how well they play. Now, there are some uh, some big injuries this week. Obviously, Anthony DeMeo is still out. You and I believe he's going to be out for the year. Ryan Lee, physically unable to perform list. Kyle Hartzell, out. Jack Neer, out. Going to be interesting to see who steps up. P. Harb got signed, um, which I love. I'm happy he's back. Um, but, you know, the LSM depth has been tough this year, whether it was, you know, Sexton being out, now Kyle Hartzell out. Um, that's been a, a, a tough spot for this team in terms of depth this year. When do we go – and like drop Mitch Bartolo or something and go get Resetti. When do we do that? Like it's pretty it's pretty obvious if we look around the league, there aren't too many teams that run one LSM. I think there's only one. And it's the whip snakes. And I mean there's a reason why they only run one LSM. Mm -hmm. yeah, you need more than one LSM to stay legit in this league. And the woods don't have that we have one in uh, one and a half one and a half because a, a closed defense is about as good as as half of an lsm like we need better than that like it just seems like they're so content with with where they are and they just feel like they have all the pieces so i, I don't know the, that is an interesting piece to me what are they going to do at lsm yeah that's going to be interesting for now for the trade deadline everything um the archers what i'm looking at is will justin and Asio figure out this cadence we'll see um no grant again this weekend looks like he's gonna be out through the all-star break obviously um i mean there's not much that's really disappointed me about the archers this year their two losses are one goal games i think they've looked very very good it's just a matter of them closing in those one goal games 
Um, but like overall, like I have not been disappointed in watching them play this year. And I think they got a good like preview of a physical defense last week when they played Atlas with some big body defenders. They're going to get a, another big sample size, you know, with Garrett Apple, with Eddie, um, and Arden. So I'm excited to, to see this matchup. Um, but I think the the big X factor is the you know archers have the better goalie right now, and Redwoods have the better faceoff guy right now. It's a matter of which one steps up to you know play a factor, one way or the other, you know for whoever's going to win. I think a big point in this game for the archers is going to be their defense. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they have a defense that can play that <laughs> island game. You know what I like. I, they have very good short stick D mids. They have, you know, solid guys, but like they're one of those teams that is a unit. Like mm-hmm. they play well as a unit, six guys who work with each other and slide and double team. If the Redwoods are running this offense, they've been running with six initiators out there. They're going to have a very tough time helping each other out and sliding. It's going to be a lot of Island guys. So like, can you go out there and defend your guy one-on-one and not get beat? I don't know if the archers really have the kind of defense to do that. And if they, and that's really what I'm looking for. Like, are they going to come out and just shut me up and be like, Hey, we're still very good athletes that know how to play lacrosse. And if, if it's going to come down to one-on-one, you're not better than me. Like, that's what I like about one-on-one in lacrosse. Like it's strictly who is better. Are you better than me at lacrosse or not? And, you know, that's what we're going to be able to see this weekend is a lot of is the Redwoods offense strictly better than the Archers defense. I'll say I think the Archers have what it takes to play that island style of defense because they're two big dogs in Warren Jeffrey, who's back now, and Graham Hasek have that NLL experience where they can kind of just body guys up. And then you have Matt McMahon, who is just an athlete. I think they have what it takes, and like you said, their short stick D middies are nasty. It's probably my favorite overall group of short stick D middies in the league. Um, and I mean, if if Dominique scores, that's game over. You can't get demoralized. <laughs> I think my worry is that the strongest dodging point is Jules on Jared Connors. Or Scott Riff. Like that's a that's a problem. You don't want anyone dodging on your your pole. Like you're literally like that's literally Jules looking at your best defensive midfielder and going, You're not better than me. You'll never be better than mm-hmm. me. But that's also scary because now you're saying Miles and Serge, Charlie Bertrand are running against short sticks all day long. It's scary with the way the, the Woods offense has played the last two weeks. Those three guys are clicking. Those four guys are clicking. Like they're running against short sticks all day. Like they're gonna score a lot, especially if Jules is going too. So it's it's do I think they could do it? Yes. But are there a lot of question marks? Mm-hmm. Yes. And I think the biggest is possessions. Going back to the stripe, TD's winning the way we think he will in this matchup. Archers are going to be playing a lot of defense. That'll be a big test. Um, I'm excited for this matchup, big time. Atlas Chrome, two stud-ass teams back at the top of the table. Um, Atlas 3-1, Chrome 4-0. My advice to both of these teams, just keep doing what you're doing. Like, it's working. Uh, The thing that I'm just most looking forward to and getting my popcorn ready for is Trevor versus Thor a.k.a. Connor Farrell, um, because that face-off battle is going to be one for the ages, and I can't wait. This is this is my game of the weekend, hands down. Um, so get your popcorn ready at 9.45 p.m. Eastern time on ESPN+, Plus, because Atlas Chrome is going to be a movie. Do you feel any different, like, at all? Because I feel like this game is just, like, going to be the heavyweight matchup of the weekend. Oh no, I'm not opposed to this whatsoever at all. Like, um, I think for me, it's it's the face off stripe, like, and and Scannoni. 
Scannoni has been unbelievable this year. I've actually had a lot of fun watching him play. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm definitely in to see if Thor continues to reign supreme this year and drinks another gallon of milk at the end of a game because he had another monster game or if TD finally, or if Trevor finally slows him down. And then also just to see if Scannoni continues his hot streak of unbelievable play in that. Fill in the blank for me. I'm going to do this for both guys. Trevor has to win blank percent for Atlas to win. This number is going to sound crazy. I think it's going to be crazy for both. But like 80%. And I say that because of the same point I was just making about the Archer's defense. That Chrome defense does play total island ball, and they're very good at it. So, sure, you know, Atlas can win at the stripes 65% of the time, you know, 68% of the time. But if you're going down and turning it over or getting one shot and done, you're not really helping yourself. You're pretty much running the same amount of possessions as Chrome is. So, yeah, they got to be more up toward 80, 85 so that they're overcompensating for some of their their quick possessions. And on the flip side, Connor Farrell has to win blank percent of the faceoffs for Chrome to win. Ooh. Uh, once again, wild number, but I'm going to go a little lower. And I'm more like 68 to 70 just because of defense and offense, like the way Atlas's defense plays versus – the way Chrome offenses play. Like Chrome could have a lot more opportunity off of their possession and they will make them last, in my opinion, a little more. Like Chrome coming down quickly in transition and getting one shot off is okay, in my opinion, versus Atlas. If that one shot is a save and it's going the other way, Chrome's more prepared to defend and bounce back in that in my opinion than Atlas is. So I feel like Chrome's in a better position with how their offense is constructed to work against Atlas's defense than the vice versa. I think the magic number at the stripe is 67%. Whoever wins 67% or closest to, I think that's who's going to win. Battle of two teams struggling kicks us off on Saturday. The Chaotic Bandits get Chris Cloutier back this week. They are taking on the Cannons, who sit at one and three. Uh, and just real quick, from the Chrome and Atlas game, no injury issues of note. Just Joe Post, Connor Farrell's backup, is on the pup list. Um, Chaos, Cannons, some injury notes. Max Adler still on the pup list. And then uh, Cannons, Ryan Tierney is listed as questionable. With an upper body injury. Tyson Bell. Is listed as questionable. With a torso injury. And Tim Edwards. On the pup list. Cannon's just got to learn how to close games. Like that has been their issue. Outside of that week one win. All year long. They cannot close. For whatever reason. Um, and Chaos. You just got to win a game. Before the All-Star break. Boys are back. You guys have played together year round pretty much. I know it's it's been a grueling NLL season, but you just got to go out there and, and flow. And I, just, I quite honestly, from this chaos team, DJ, I want to see more of Challen Rogers, like featured almost, because he is healthy, he is fresh. Like, don't let the chaos guys feel like they have to do too much. Challen's been playing fantastic. Um, feature him a little bit more. You know, feature your, your midfielders a little bit more. Dane had a great game, even though he did look a little tired towards the end, which makes sense. He had a great game. Chase had a great game. Alleviate some of the stress off of some of these guys, you know, getting back into the swing of things. And just move the ball around, play chaos ball, and just want to see the defense step up a little bit more in front of Blaze because I think they had a little down tick of a game last week. Um, that kind of left Blaze out on an island, and Jared said that in the press conference afterwards as well. Um, but, I mean, Chaos have what it takes to beat this Cannons team. Oh, I Plain would agree. Simple. I would agree 100%. Um, 
this one's going to be a very interesting game because I don't necessarily think Cannons are struggling. I just think they've run into a tough schedule to start the year. Like, I think they're and, – and they were in a position where they were – putting a team together like they're just finding their flow versus chaos is it's more what do you mean? Like the, a, the flow is on jersey number 22 ryan jenner well, flow god i mean i don't even know i think tyson might have the best flow on their team now he's, those he's, those two hands down have the best hair like in the league if you ask me dren dog is, is he's he's tilt master he's tilt god that's what he is like that's what i've always known ryan jenner for is his tilt it's ridiculous i don't even know how he sees anything that's probably how he wears his hats too like what up? What up, though? My name is Ryan Jenner. <laughs> Not the what up, though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so I, yeah, I don't think, I think this is more of a game for chaos than it is Chrome or for Cannons. I think Cannons are continuing. Like, they feel like they're in a good spot. Like, we're figuring our offense out. Like, we found very good things in that last game. Our defense is gelling together. We're getting pretty good play from Nick Morocco, Stephen Kelly is good at face like you know they're just finding their groove whereas chaos is like they don't want to quite hit the panic button but they're like kind of like okay like we understand the situation we were in but we still need to kick it into gear like if they don't win this weekend they're starting to really ask questions and think about hitting the panic button whereas cannons lose this weekend they're like eh yeah we're one and one and three one and four four. yeah we're one and four but you know, we have this going for ourselves and we can really turn this around the next few weeks and end up being three and four, you know, end up being four and four before we know it. I think there's big pressure on both teams to win this weekend. Um, you know, obviously Cavs don't want to go into the all-star break at 0-5, but I think Cannons are a much better team than what they've presented, like you said. And they need to show it. And it all breaks down to playing a full 48 minutes, which they have not done since week one, pretty much, in the grand scheme of things. Even though Lyle said they didn't play a full 48 minutes that game. Um, Weekend wraps up, 8.45 p.m. on Saturday Eastern Time. Whip Snakes, Water Dogs, first rematch of the season. Whips won in overtime on a ridiculous... Just an ama- That was one of the best games of the season as well. Two overtime games have done really well this year. Maybe overtime is needed more. Um, Whips, Water Dogs. I want this matchup to be a rivalry so bad. Um, I like the way Water Dogs have played this year for the most part. You know, there's been some hiccups, but overall, I think they've played really strong. And they're another team that just has needed to learn how to finish. I'm excited to see how they play coming off a win. Um, Normally you say that about teams coming off a loss for the first time. I'm excited to see how they respond after a win. And Whip Snakes, uh, you know, Coach Staggs chewed them a new one in the locker room at halftime against Woods. Um, So they just got to keep the ball rolling. And, you know, we'll see if Dylan Ward plays. We'll see if Matt DeLuca plays. And just another uh, Zach Tucci matchup that I'm I'm excited to see how he approaches Joe Nardella. Um, but again, I think it just comes down to, you know, this this is one of those games that I think it just comes down to who has the ball last. Yeah, no, I, oof, I don't know, was the ball last? Wow, I can't say who had the ball last. I think it's more of a who makes a a play, like a a a loose ball play or like a hustle play like that. And it's going to be an energy thing that sparks a run. Like that's really where this game is going to go. Like it's going to this is going to be a big energy game. It's Mm -hmm. all about guys selling out, making plays, you know, doing things to really help the team out. In the words of Michael Sowers, there's layers. Yeah, yeah. The layers have to definitely get moving. This is the layers will be moving uh for either side, honestly. Um the whips are very much a layers team as well. Like but they're a different kind of layers team. Like the water dogs have like layers on offense, whereas the whip snakes are a layers team. Like if one layer is not playing well, it triggers 
it trickles into the other layers. Mm -hmm. Whereas the water dogs, their defense could be playing spot on. But if there's a layer in their offense that isn't playing well, it wrinkles their offense. So I, I layers is definitely the, the word to use for this game. 100%. And uh, DJ, I don't know if you hear that. Ah, the Ducks. The Ducks are here. It's time to feed some Minnesota Ducks. The PLL Minnesota Picks of the Week. Brought to you by the homies over at Pickup. You guys can go to playpickup.com. Start playing the hottest headlines in sports. You rack up points on your fan profiles. Cash them in for prizes on the Pickup Marketplace. Go to playpickup.com. Deej, let's kick things off in Minnesota with the Archers and the Redwoods. Two teams looking to bounce back. Archer sitting at two and two. Woods sitting at one and three. How are we feeling in this first matchup of Minnesota? People are going to be looking at me like I'm crazy. But I absolutely love the way the Woods offense is running right now. I got some faith in TD at the stripe this week. I'm not even going to think about the goalie scenario. That's not my concern. I just think the offense is at a position where they're going to really challenge that Archer's defense to play solo island defense. And I think they have enough to beat them in that, that capacity. So I'll take the woods. First swing game of the week. First swing game of the week, baby. Bows up. I got to go Archers. I got to go Archers simply because the goalie situation is better for them. Um, I like the fluidity of their offense. It doesn't matter who it is. And I think, you know, like I said, their two losses are one goal games. I think they've played fantastic. They could easily be 4-0 as well um, if a couple bounces go their way. So... I'm going to go Archers. I think they're playing really, really well to start this season. And uh, I just need to see consistency from the Redwoods before I can like feel comfortable picking them. So moving on to the game of the week, in our opinion. 9.45 p.m. Eastern Time. East Coast, get your caffeine ready. Atlas taking on Chrome. Are we at that point in the season, Deej? Are we at that point in the season where a certain team has not given us reason to pick against them or because of this matchup. Is this is this the new Buffalo Bandits Toronto Rock in the NLL right now for the PLL? Or do you think Atlas are overachieving? No, I think um, I very much reached that point where I can't go against Chrome because they have not given me a reason to. Um, but it... To me, it's all about that defense. It's something just unbelievable about watching a team. Like they could almost they could ball watch. <laughs> it's so funny they could ball watch because they're like, "Yo, yep, JT's about to guard Lyle, and Lyle's not doing the thing." Like that is so unheard of to think. Just to say, "Oh yeah, that one guy is gonna guard that one guy, and I don't have to worry about doing." Anything just makes my defensive prowess just uh, <laughs> that's probably getting clipped <laughs> so yeah I'm, I'm going chrome yeah i'm going chrome as well like y'all thought i was gonna go against the buttes no shot they're playing so well right now um and that's no slight of Atlas. i think this is the toughest game to pick um and it wouldn't shock me if atlas win but I think Chrome are just playing at such a high level right now that, you know, they also have a defense that this Atlas offense has not seen yet. Very similar to that Whip Snakes matchup, um, just in a different sense. Um, so I'm going to go Chrome as well. Let's kick it to Saturday. Chaos and Cannons. How do you see this one going down between the Chaotic Bandits and the Boom Squad? Um. Do not hate me 13 and 3.2%, but I absolutely like the way the Cannons have been playing recently. Like I said, I think they're very much finding their groove and Chaos is putting their team together. Like 
you know, it's it's no slight at them, but Cannons are looking to turn the corner. Like they're starting, you can see that they're starting to get to the position where they're like, yeah, we, I, I don't know how to say it. Like they're not just trying to execute anymore. They're trying to win. Like they've gotten past the, okay, we're trying to do this so we can see what works for us. They're at the point to where we know what works. We just need to go out and do it so we can win games. Like I'm very confident in Cannon's coming out to turn the corner this weekend. Like this is their weekend where they're like, okay, we're going against a quote unquote struggling team. This is a chance for us to put everything together and play 48 minutes against a team who's also just trying to play 48 minutes. Um, I just got I got done contemplating back and forth on this game. And this is what I got to say. 3.2%? Give me the chaos. They, they can't afford to go into the All-Star break without a win. Um, and I think they're ready to get back to winning. I think it's, it's there. I think last week was kind of just a fluke. Um, and now that pretty much everybody's back for the most part, I, I think they get their first one. And I think cannons are in a spot for me where until they can close a game out, it's tough to pick them because you're looking at it and it's like, sure, they're up by a certain amount and then a team goes on a run and then they lose in the end. It's tough for me to, to justify picking them right now. Um, so I'm going to go with chaos to get their first dub of the year. And then we got whips and water dogs. Are whip snakes in that same pantheon as chrome i'll tell you what guys they are for me i gotta go with whips right now simply because their defense looks so good and the last time these two teams played it was a defensive showdown for the most part it was a very low scoring game in terms of pll uh scoring um, and Kyle Burnlaw is playing out of his goddamn mind. Give me the whips to win against the dogs. I think it'll be another close matchup. Um, but give me the whips. They have not reached that point for me yet. Um, I think they've kind of gotten away with a few they shouldn't have in my opinion they played some very close games this year um and teams kind of just handed them some wins they in my opinion didn't deserve but nonetheless they are 4-0 um looking at this game x factors ryan brown and if i know that i feel like the whips know that so he pulls arguably the toughest matchup in the pll because it's one of the most not talked about matchups in the PLL. Being guarded by Tim Muller sucks. Mm -hmm. It sucks. And I feel like Ryan Brown is going to get the Tim Muller matchup this weekend. And he's going to get very much a Brett Kennedy, Jay Carlson type of matchup. Where he's going to get no room to breathe. He's going to have to work very hard to get a shot off. And it's going to really mess with the flow of that that layers of offense for the water dogs and whip snakes trying to come out with the win. So to recap, DJ's going Redwoods, Chrome, Cannons, and Whip Snakes. I, your boy, is going with Archers, Chrome, Chaos, and Whip Snakes. And those are our PLL Minnesota picks of the week brought to you by the homies over at pickup. Deej, what better way to uh, welcome in a new month than with the homie who needs to get on a fucking team already? God damn it.
Ladies and gents, we're kicking off the month of July for you with a Mountain Dew Summertime Dew Review. It's a new one. It is a Drake Porter Dew Review of Baja Gold. Now, you're all probably wondering, previously on this show, we did a review of Maui Burst, which was a pineapple flavored drink mountain dew baja gold is also due with a blast of natural and artificial pineapple flavor dj and i were not very keen on the maui burst because we're not big pineapple guys per se uh so to refresh your memory dj gave maui burst a 7.8 i gave it a 7.3 for an average score of 7.6 We'll see how this one goes. I can already say it's probably not going to be that great. Uh, as opposed to the Maui Burst, that was kind of more of a, you know, uh, solid, for lack of a better term. It was more cloudy. The Baja Gold is very see-through, and it kind of looks like urine. <laughs> I'm not a fan of the color. Yeah. You can kind of, like, see through the the liquid. Um very cool logo. It's a uh, like scuba diver, and the gear is pineapple. He's got like a King Triton scepter and everything. I'll say that Mountain Dew is crushing it with the mascots on the flavors. Um, everything about this reminds me of the SpongeBob movie, like yes. King Neptune, the scuba diver guy, pineapple, pineapple. Like it's just total SpongeBob SquarePants movie. Yeah. So we are going to crack open the Baja Gold for the first summertime Baja review. Okay, technically the second. Of the Baja, because there's multiple Baja Okay, first flavors. Baja, yes. Oh, yes. Not the first summer, just to clarify for the people. Yeah. First summertime Baja, because they released a bunch. I just got word from the homie <laughs> pre-crack. Oh, man. That it's fire. He oh, said it's boy. gas. It smells decent. It smells very pineapple. With like the like a hint of like Baja like yeah. zest. <laughs> it's like wine. Literally. <laughs> like swirling around. You just gotta, you gotta smell it first. You gotta waff it. <laughs> So here we I'm, go. I'm not even a smell. <laughs> I don't even smell my food before I eat it. I don't know what's going on. Baja Gold do review. Shout out Drake Porter. Happy summer. can't tell if it tastes the same as it does Maui not burst. It does not like on the front end yes but on the back end it feels like somebody dropped a little tiny bit of cough syrup in my in my baja that i had last night like it's 7 a.m i woke up i took a sip of the baja by my bed and it tastes like someone dropped cough syrup in it I don't hate this. I don't know. It's not like bad. Like I'm talking. It's like way the, better than I expected. I'm talking the good cough syrup, like <laughs> not lean, but like. <laughs> but you know how like you know how like you have to like taste some cough syrup. And yeah. You're like you're like thinking about it before. You're like ugh, cough syrup, and then you like you're like and then it's fine. Oh, that's like not that, that's like that kind of cough syrup. It's like there's a little bit of that in my leftover Baja that I got from Taco Bell. I don't hate... I thought I was going to be, like, pretty down on this. I thought I was going to be very similar to Maui Burst, and I'm not. I definitely like this more than Maui Burst. Yeah, and I don't know what it is. I feel like I need to have them both side by side and have, like, a palate cleanser and see what the difference is. 
Because we did Maui Bear so long ago. <laughs> Could you imagine just like... Let's <laughs> get a Ritz cracker. <laughs> We did Maui Burst so long ago. Like, that was our fourth one. I don't remember what it tastes like because I was like, eh, this yeah. kind of stinks. We've been chugging. All right, Deej. Baja Gold. Now, you did say it was better than Maui Burst, which you gave a 7.8 to. It's weird because I have to keep this relative to everything else I've had. That's when, like, now that we've had so many, it starts to get tough because you have mm -hmm. to keep this relative to other tastes. And this is a 7 9 because Maui Burst gets a 7 8. This is better than Maui Burst, but this is not better than Legend. And Legend had an 8. Very true. So, like, that that's what I mean. Like, but I also like can say like this also could have gotten an eight or like an eight one. But like that's also if legend wasn't an eight. If legend was rated higher than eight in my book, I could do that. It's definitely better than Maui Burst, I think. I gave Maui Burst a seven point three, which is my third lowest score. I'm going to give this I, I think I'm on the same page as you. I'm going to give it a 7.9. Easy math. 7.9 average. Yeah. I think it's a 7.9. It's, it's solid. Is it my first choice? No. But if it's there, would I have it? Possibly. It's not the worst pineapple tasting thing. And it doesn't even really taste pineapple-y per se. I don't know what it is. But it's, it's not it's not live wire, you know, like I'm not gonna completely right. ignore it. It's not flaming hot. Yeah, like it's not something I'm gonna be like, eh, nah, don't want it. <laughs> but like if there's other ones there, am I picking this one? No. Yeah, like I think Spark is obviously better. Major Melon to me is better. I could take Major. I could. Mm, you gave Major could take, Melon a seven eight. I could take Major Melon over this because, like, Major Melon is. I'm cool with artificial watermelon. I'm not a big watermelon guy, but like, I'm cool like that. That one, I could justify like at a summer cookout, at a barbecue, or whatever. Like, I could justify having one of those because it would taste good with the food. Like, Legend but, is definitely better than this. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I regret every day my frostbite score. I think frostbite's still one of the best we've had. I I went way too high. I went off the hype. I think of finding it. <laughs> <laughs> you did just find it that day. Or like, look, you literally texted me like, look what I just found. I was like, what? Bet. I looked it up immediately on the do locator. I said, oh, it's at Walmart. Drove and got myself a case. If I could rescore Frostbite from the can, obviously, I'd probably knock it down a full point and put it at 7-8. Did you... You still have those? Yeah. Yeah, because mine was gone in a few days. <laughs> I slammed them. <laughs> yeah. I thought they were so good. I thought they were so good. This is not bad. Like, I could see myself having this with, like, food, too. Which but I think what? is key. I can see this with wings. Shish kebabs. This shrimp. was slap with some shrimp chicken and like vegetable shish kebabs. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, yes. A couple pieces of steak thrown on there too. Yeah. Well, probably some asparagus or something and like asparagus and rice or something on the side. Like, yeah. This is good. I'm cool with that. Seven, it's good, nine, not solid. great. Yes. 7-9 is solid. So there's our Drake Porter do review. Baja Gold. Deej and I went on a 
bounty hunt to get a few flavors. So we got some on deck that we'll either pre-record and throw into episodes or we'll just have them saved up. Um, and we do have a few that are exclusive, for, exclusive for certain reasons. Some that for certain are, somebody. <laughs> yeah. And some that are only uh, available near KB. Some that are only available Correct. really near me because of the stores they're available in. There's that they're one that's in, in like location. Iowa that needs to hook us up. <laughs> you know, I got a I got a coworker now from Kansas, and he dri- and you know he's he might drive back. So if he drives back through Iowa, I'll have him try and locate that for us and and work something out. Because there's that already like it slaps. There's already the purple thunder that I have to bring to you because you don't have a Circle K within Correct. like hours of you for whatever reason, and I have one. Well, it's because we have Wawa. <laughs> I have yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You have the one stop shop. Um, no free ads, but yes. Yeah, I mean we love a Wawa. Shout out Harry Styles. Um, let's wrap up with some quick hits. We got NLL awards season. Awards officially announced, full blown. Shout out to the NLL for getting them all out before we recorded. Um, some friends of the program winning some awards, which is awesome to see. Um, everybody who won, very well deserved, obviously. Um, but Deej, let's go through these awards because, again, we 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 nailed most of them. We nailed most of them going into the season. We nailed most of them during the season. So your award winners for the 2021-2022 NLL season look like this. Should we start with the award winners or the... No, yeah, we'll start with the award winners and we'll talk about the first team and second team and all that good stuff. So, scrolling it all the way back to Tuesday when we had our first round of award winners. The... For Pete, Sportsmanship Award winner, Lyle Thompson. No-brainer there. You and I both agree. It's beyond well-deserved. Shot Not to even, Lyle. Yeah, we don't even really need to say anything about that. He is uh, the only player to win the award four times since its inception in 2002. The teammate of the year stays in the family, Jeremy Thompson. Very well-deserved. Follows the show on Twitter. It's a little podcast science for you, people. Just a little bit. This next one gets a round of applause from me. The Tom Borelli Media Person of the Year. Friend of the program. Big team guy. The grinder himself. Pat Gregoire gets the Tom Borelli Award for Media Person of the Year. Pat works his ass off. Deserves it through and through. Whether it's podcasting with Lacrosse Flash Doing the broadcast for TSN and Halifax. He's a rock star. Knows his stuff. He's very entertaining on the broadcast. Super pumped for my guy to win the award. Shout out to Pat Gregoire. Yeah, no, I'm actually really excited about that. Like, he deserves it 100%. Um, He puts in a lot of work. Um, Maybe the PLL can talk to him about coming over and doing some more work with them. I think that would be awesome as well. Um, Maybe it can help bridge the gap a little a little bit between NLL and POL and kind of help with the crossover for fans and all of that jazz. But uh, he put in a lot of work this season, and, I mean, his broadcasts are some of my favorite to watch. So uh, definitely well-deserved award. Round of applause to us for this next one. We had this in our preseason prediction. The coach of the year, the man, the myth, the legend himself, Tracy Koloski, TK, walking away with the lead, the Les Bartley Head Coach of the Year Award, uh, the third coach to win the award as a first-year coach, and the first to win the award as a rookie coach for an expansion team. Shout out to TK. I could not be happier. Uh, you know, from his time with the Wings, he was always you know looking out for the media people afterwards, asking how we were, you know, just chopping it up with us. He is an all-time just amazing dude. And I could not be more thrilled that he won Coach of the Year in his first year with Panther City. Yeah, I mean, what was it? Week 14, 15, we were talking about them possibly being second in the conference and making They won like six straight. And and there was even a scenario where they could have won out and been first 
in the conference as an expansion team is unreal. And, you know, that's big credit to not only the players, but TK and his staff. You can't leave out his staff. They definitely helped him a lot in that. And um, I'm sure when he got this award, he turned around and said, thank you to everyone. Like, you guys are the reason I got this award. You know, thank you for doing your jobs and helping me out. Um, he's the, in one. He's just that kind of guy. Like, I don't know, you know, um, a bunch about him uh, other than, you know, stories I've heard and just a little bit I've been able to see in my NLL time, but he's definitely the kind of guy to show praise when it's expected. Very humble guy. So well-deserved award after a very good season. Excited to see Panther City come out again next year. He'll be on this show at some point. No doubt about it. Uh, your GM of the year, Steve Dietrich from the Buffalo Bandits. Not much you can say. Just a fantastic um, performance by him as a GM. Uh, he is now tied with Derek Keene and the Rush GM for most GM of the Year awards all time with three. Shout out to Steve Dietrich. Executive of the Year, Toronto Rock, Jamie Dowick. This season, obviously, Toronto relocated to uh, Hamilton. Did a great job. Toronto's always a perennial contender. No surprise there that he gets Executive of the Year. Um, moving on to the Player Awards. Transition player of the year, Zach Courier, no brainer. Not much else to to say there. He led the Roughnecks in block shots with 11. He led the league in loose ball recoveries with 237, and he set a league record for most caused turnovers in a season with 62. Can't beat that. Can't top that. Shout out to Zach Courier. Uh, your defensive player of the year, Mitch Desnew. Tied for second in the NLL with 39 caused turnovers. Led the Rock with 185 loose balls and 18 block shots. And he led the only defense to allow fewer than 10 goals per game. I almost... Pretty good. A lot of people were upset about this. And I almost agreed with them in terms of Steve Priolo getting robbed of, you know, another NLL Defensive Player of the Year. But, like, after, you know... What you just said, I kind of looked into it after, you know, hearing everybody's stuff and looking at the stats. And I was like, um, Mitch just pretty good. Was more than pretty good. He was the best defensive player in the league this year. Like, <laughs> do I think Priolo had a case? Yes, because he – there's this thing, like, when you play sports, like, when you're so good defensively, a lot of guys don't try things on you, so your stats kind of suffer for that mm -hmm. reason. So there's kind of that going for him. But still, when you look at the campaign Desnu had, you can't override that and give it to Priolo. Deej, for the eighth time in the last 12 seasons, Matt Vince is your goaltender of the year. He led the NLL in wins with 14, 747 saves, and a an .807 save percentage. Led the Bandits to the best overall record in the league, obviously. And he tallied his 130th regular season W. No other player has 110. Pretty good. I, I think the only reason he wins this is the record. Mm -hmm. You know, like we can bring up pretty much all the same stats we just brought up for just Snoo because they pretty much all apply for Nick Rose. But their offense couldn't help them out enough to win enough games so that he would have a better record to win this. You cannot disregard 14 wins by a goalie, especially when you're only playing 18 games. And if you look at, you know, the four games they lost, we easily could have been talking about Buffalo being 18 and up. Mm -hmm. Cause I think maybe there was one game they got blown yeah. out in, but the other three were one, two goal games. And that's a matter of inches, a few pipes, you know, that kind of stuff. So really we're talking about a 17 and one or 18 and 0 team. And that goalie would have been a big part of that. Can't dismiss that at all. Friend of the program is your MVP. Dane Smith does it again. Uh, shattered the single season assist record with 94 led the league in points with 135 led the league with 13.7 goals scored per game, and he is only the fifth player 
in NLL history to win MVP more than once. And if he does it again next year, playing this way, he'll tie the only person to have three, his current head coach, John Tavares. Which I mean, he's a baller, man. Some pretty elite company. There's not, I mean, there's nothing to be said about about this award other than well deserved. Yeah. Uh, and this next one, well deserved. Jeff T, your rookie of the year. He broke the NLL record for points and assists in a season by a rookie. He was second in loose ball recoveries among rookies with 111, and he was fourth in the league in scoring with 108 points, 37 goals, 71 assists. Again, not much else you can say. Jeff T was spectacular this year, and he missed some time, too, because he was on the COVID list. Think about if he got to play in those two back-to-back games uh, early in the season. Jeff Teet's fantastic. His career's just getting started, and uh, very well-deserved award. Yeah. I mean, Dodds gave him a run for his money for a little bit, but it, that ended pretty quickly. Your NLL first team, all NLL. Dane Smith, Zach Courier, Joe Resitardis, Mitch Desnu, Matt Vince, Steve Priolo. I don't think there's any arguments across the board there. And then your second team all league, Ryan Lee, Latrell Harris. Shout out to the Pineapple Express, baby. Jeff T, Kyle Rubish, Nick Rose. Shout out to Mr. PSA himself and friend of the program, Challen Rogers. Bunch of Toronto Rock, bunch of award winners, very well deserved. Uh, and your all rookie team, which. Deej, I'm pretty sure we called four of these six preseason. Jeff T, Patrick Dodds, Tahoka Nanticoke, Reed Bowering, Stephen Orleman, Ryan Smith. Very solid group for all, um, all lead teams, all rookie team. Like, I can't argue with any. Obviously, I could advocate to slot in a couple guys, but it would be hard for me to slot out guys. But there's definitely guys that were definitely, in my opinion, in the conversation and uh, made these decisions a little harder than what some may think. Um, but now that I'm thinking about it, we didn't even discuss rookie team for our team. So I, I guess that's probably going to get added to the list. Yeah, the OTB team will be coming uh, in the next couple of weeks. Luckily, Deej, next week. NLL expansion draft during the bye week for the PLL, uh, which is fantastic for us. A couple more quick hits here. Uh, you brought this story to my attention, the Uganda Women's Lax National Team. Uh, I'll let you talk to the people about this one because you had way more information about it than I did. Um, crazy story, um, but it, it was all over lacrosse Twitter when I tapped in and you know was looking for everything, but... Uh, let the people know about a story that you and I both agree is not getting enough talk. Yeah, so i am been very bad about being on lacrosse social media recently because of all the coaching and working and just taking up my time. But it, I had a little bit of downtime today, and I actually got on, and, like, the first thing I see is, like, the Ugandan women's national team wasn't able to make it in terms of visa problems, which – isn't a big deal because like we've seen this happen with multiple teams in the past and like it happens with individual people all the time visas are a huge problem like we get that but the lack of coverage and the lack of knowledge across like not like simply just lacrosse twitter was unbelievable to me like this was last night that this information came out it came out during the women's uh What's uh, what am I thinking? Women's lacrosse championships. Yeah, they had their opening ceremony, and obviously, you know, all the teams come out. They're wearing um, cultural apparel, and they sing their national anthems. The Ugandan team wasn't there. People were asking about it. Once again, no one really saw anybody asking about it. And then eventually, you know, it came out from USA Lacrosse, or yeah, from it was either USA Lacrosse or like World Championship Lacrosse that came out, and we're like yeah, the Ugandan team couldn't make it because they were having passport issues. And, like, that was pretty much the end of it. And, like, you know, it's been a big outrage from players now, and that's really where a lot of this is coming out. Their coach has even spoken out about it, and he's had a lot to say on Twitter kind of just about how heartbroken they are and 
kind of just the situation they're in is not a good one. So I just don't understand how this keeps happening. Like, one, we should be advocating for women's sports in general because if this was a men's national team, they either A, wouldn't have had the issue of visas or everyone on lacrosse Twitter would know and be talking about it. Or if this was another sport, it wouldn't happen. This literally doesn't happen in other sports. Where are the visa issues during the World Cup? Where are the visa issues during the FIBA National Championships? Where are the visa issues during the Olympics? Like, these things don't happen in other sports. So there's a problem right there. It was like lacrosse matters. Like, we need to advocate for lacrosse. We need to advocate for women's lacrosse. We need to advocate for women's sports and just women beyond sports. Like, this is such a big issue that this didn't get the coverage it got. That was my main issue with this. Like, visa issue is, like, it sucks, but there's, like, not much we can say about that. That is a worldwide issue that happens everywhere. But to not have coverage of it, whether it's because it's lacrosse or because it's a women's sport, is such a big issue. Well said, man. Couldn't agree more. Like, it's wild that, like, you and I are very tapped into all facets of the game as much as possible and it wasn't brought to your attention until this morning and it wasn't brought to my attention until you brought it to my attention um we just gotta be better we just gotta be better in terms of just you know getting these types of things spotlight because like you said there is an issue with that whether it is the visa issue being for the sport because no other sport do we really hear about visa issues like What's causing these things? Um, you know, it being women's lacrosse, not getting the same covers that men's lacrosse would get. There is some sort of issue. There's some sort of stigma that needs to be addressed, and we just got to be better. We got we to gotta be better with all of it. Um, I think I saw something where they are close to getting them there. I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure I saw something where, like, their debut is going to be delayed, but they will get a chance to play or something like that um so i'm hoping that's the case um but yeah i'm hoping that i mean they they get an opportunity yeah that'd be lovely if they can get over here and you know compete in the games this year um it would suck if they have to wait a year or whatever but i mean i also put out how about we just take the games to them like how hard is it really for americans to get visas i don't really hear too many americans like having visa problems like Canadians have visa problems here in America, but that's like about it. Like it seems to be a lot easier for Northern Americans to go and have visas in other places. So why don't we just move the championships on that side of the earth? Like not only is that helping grow the game nationally, like internationally, but like it's also just making it easier for everyone to compete. Hundred percent agree. Um, so hopefully the ladies get a chance to compete because they deserve to um and it seems like 110 percent of this was out of their control um but also i mean speaking of this championship i went to the bowling alley yesterday walked past the bar it's on espn too and it's just chilling and i was like yo like i literally like hit my friends and i was like yo this is wild dude this is fucking wild like i just walked past the tv and lacrosse is on like that's not gonna happen too many times like this is awesome Mm-hmm. So, like, if you have time, watch the women's championships. Like, they're on ESPN. They're going to be on the main channels from time to time. They're also on ESPN Plus, so replays are available. Go out and support. That's one of the first. That's the first way we can really get things rolling and get better is to actually support just from watching on your TV. TV ratings mean a lot. That's how we get it on TV. That's how more random people watch that's how more money gets into it that's how things grow and these kind of problems stop happening it starts with us literally just watching on tv 100 percent. and one thing you can watch on tv this year not an ad not a sponsor the espies because agent ocho and groot are nominated for ncaa player of the year awards at the espies charlotte north logan wisnowskis both nominated for college athlete of the year um Super dope that one, both of them are nominated. And two, Paul Rabel tweeted about it and said, We're gonna have just a lacrosse specific category sooner rather than later, which is also going to be 
fucking cool. I think we should. I mean, like, look at the sport and, like, you know, what kind of sport it is. And when it gets to the level where it's drawing in those kind of crowds, they won't be able to deny how good of a sport lacrosse is. And, they're, you know, we're going to have to have that platform where it's, like, lacrosse player of the year, not, you know, college lacrosse player of the year, not college athlete of the year. And, I mean, I think – I think Charlotte has a little bit better of a chance than Logan does. I mean, that's tough to say, but when you start thinking about, you know, ratings and money Mm -hmm. and, you know, what sports bring in, like looking at a football or basketball player, that's normally who that award goes to on the male side. Charlotte was unbelievable this year, and I'd arguably say she probably brought in the most money on the women's side. So she has a very strong case, in my opinion. It'd be nice to see them both win. Or nice to see either one of them win if it's only one. So I'll be tuning into the SBs to see. Yeah, I'm pulling it up here to see who is nominated across the board for the college athlete. Um, so this, yeah, it seemed like it was pretty much just like one one person from each sport. So best college athlete men's sports: Bryce Young from Alabama football, not Web Snakes Lacrosse Club. Uh, Dante Polvara, Georgetown men's soccer. That's very cool to see as well. Uh, Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga. And then Logan for Maryland lacrosse. Uh, and then women's, it is uh, Aaliyah Boston from South Carolina no women's basketball. Jalen Howell, Florida State soccer. Uh, Jocelyn Allo from Oklahoma softball. And then Charlotte North. Okay, I'm very wrong. Let's flip that. Logan has Logan a has a chance. much better chance. Those girls are like legit. I know all three of those girls. Yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. That that's a pretty. It's a loaded women's category. Yeah, yeah. Now I'm interested to see who's gonna win on that women's side more than anything. Like, and if Charlotte does that, that's very huge for the game of lacrosse. Very like, huge. Alabama didn't win the national title. No. I don't know how Georgetown men's soccer did. Because of him. <laughs> Gonzaga did not win the title. No, and Chet Holmgren wasn't even the best player in the country. And <laughs> Logan Wisnowskis won the equivalent of the Heisman for lacrosse on an undefeated roster and won undefeated a national championship. national champion. Yep. I'm just saying Logan's the best college athlete for men's sports this year. And that's all lacrosse bias aside. Looking at that and looking at the accolades, Logan is the best. And then you got the other side, the girls. It's just where loaded. All of really, them are deserving. Really, Charlotte has the worst resume. Because she's the only one who didn't win the national championship this year. <laughs> it's wild. <laughs> and that's wild to say that she has the worst resume out of those because she didn't win the national championship. She wins the national championship. It's a literal toss-up. I feel like they would just walk in the room, close their eyes, and point at one of them and be like, you get it. <laughs> Pick a name out of a hat. Yeah, literally. Because, like, and you win. <laughs> it's insane. Literally insane. What a category. I don't even know when the ESPYs are. Uh, they're coming up pretty soon. They're second week of July. It is... They're always a, like July twentieth. Yeah, I say they're always like middle of summer. So we'll see if uh, Agent Ocho and Groot can bring home the hardware. That's all we got for you guys this week. I know it was a bit of a longer episode, but moving forward should be a little bit shorter for the most part. Um, mostly PLL stuff, but we do have the expansion draft next week, which will be very very exciting. Um, which is why we just need feedback from you guys. And that's why you got to follow us on the, the Twitter machine, the Instagram, at OTB Laxpod. Twitter and Instagram. Follow DJ on Twitter at SCS underscore next great. Follow me at KBIZZL311. Check out the website, undergroundsportsphiladelphia.com, for all of our written content. Subscribe to the podcast feed on Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Leave those five-star ratings and reviews. Subscribe to the Underground Sports Philadelphia YouTube channel. Hit the like button, click the bell icon, leave comments down below, 
all that good stuff but subscribe to the youtube channel really really goes a long way for us to continue growing this thing big thank you to our sponsors tomahawk shades pickup kenwood beer and bino board all their information is linked in the show notes on audio and in the description on youtube use our promo code support our sponsors because they support us it's been a wild one enjoy the games in minnesota we're gonna have fun on the socials a little lacrosse after dark this weekend if you're a stranger things fan enjoy stranger things and uh this has been episode number 228 of the allegedly award nominated honorably mentioned and of course viewable on the youtube outside the box podcast part of the underground sports philadelphia podcast network for dj i'm kb we're getting the heck out of here peace peace Thank you.